So let's um, let's start, Greg, um, confusingly at the end. Yes. What is your vision for what this energy supply could do? What's what's the ultimate dream? Sure. So the ultimate dream is that we provide the world with a source of clean, safe, abundant, globally deployable energy that's cost effective. Wouldn't that be a wouldn't that be a fine world to live in? One in which you don't have to feel guilty when you turn on the kettle. Uh, one in which we can continue to drive our cars around. Um, yeah, a, a prosperous world in which we continue to use energy uh, to, to make our lives good, uh, but we don't harm the planet in the process of doing so. Totally repeatable, completely clean, massively yes. abundant energy. That is that is what we're aiming for, and um, and we aim to do that through a, a process called fusion energy. I, I want to, uh, again, perhaps starting slightly later on in the story mm. rather than at the beginning, can you explain for us, because we've heard it in the news recently, about this breakthrough in the United States and the significance of the breakthrough in the United States and why some people are very now very, very excited about the possibility of nuclear fusion? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, to set the stage a little bit, there, there are players around the world private companies, national labs, um, who are all focused on trying to deliver fusion energy as a source of clean and renewable energy for, for the whole world. Um, and one of, one of those labs is called the National Ignition Facility. It's based at the Lawrence Livermore uh, uh, Laboratory in the States. Um, and they just had a, a major breakthrough that they've achieved a net energy gain out of a fusion fuel um, in a reaction that they conducted in their in their device, which is based on a process called laser laser inertial confinement. So in in their experiment, and I'll I'll keep this as, as simple as Thank I can. You. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so they what what they do so so the way the way that fusion energy works. Um, is uh, it, so it's the same as the process that powers the sun and all of the stars in the universe. So what we have to do is we have to get forms of hydrogen gas up to temperatures that are pretty eye-watering, so well above 100 million degrees Celsius, about six times hotter than the center of the sun, in fact, uh, in, in these reactors. We have to get it very hot and very dense to the point where these hydrogen atoms squash together to form helium, which is the next one up in the periodic table. Um, and in doing so, it releases huge amounts of energy through, uh, through Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. Now, the way that um, the way that the National Ignition Facility have done this is by using uh, a series of about 150 plus very powerful lasers that they bear down on onto a very small capsule containing this fuel, this hydrogen fuel. Um, in the process of doing so, it makes that very hot and very dense. And what they managed to achieve was with two megawatts um, of input power through their lasers, they achieved three megawatts of output power. Um, in a, in a, a scale of some nanoseconds uh, from this amazing fusion pro process. Uh, the thing that I have to make absolutely clear to your listeners is that this is not an energy producing plant, okay? So we're talking about energy in and out of the fusion fuel. We're not talking about the electricity that went to power those lasers and so on and so forth. That, that consumes more energy than it produces. So what's important for me to get across is that there are companies such as Tokamak Energy, the company that I work for, who are really trying to make this process a commercial reality. Mm -hmm. We're trying to produce more energy out than we put in by a large margin. Um, and we, we aim to do that by the 2030s. But the... I guess perhaps the big thing in the States was the proof of concept. Yes. That you can get a net gain from doing this. Oh, it's it's incredibly it's an incredibly poignant result. It's, it's very very exciting. Um, the, the reason is that if you if you, you you can draw a bit of a box around the fusion fuel and you can look at what goes in and what comes out, and that's the bit that's the most uncertain. I would say about all of these devices is how does this very strange process um, and you know the operation of plasma. We'll go into what plasma is in a second. How does that work? Um, and do we have the physics models to, to prove that this is going to scale up into a viable source? So to have actually produced more energy out than in from this fuel is a very, very significant result. Can you tell us a bit about what you've achieved, what Tokamak Energy has achieved? You've, uh, you've got, uh, I'm going I'm to get this so wrong. Yes. But you're, you've got the plasma temperature of 100 million degrees 
Celsius. So you got it six times yeah. hotter than the sun's core. Mm -hmm. And and that's a is that a world first or the world first well, is the bit that happened afterwards? <laughs> so that's that's a world that's a world first for a private fusion company. We're the only private fusion company in the world to have achieved a, a plasma temperature of more than a hundred million degrees C in a in a commercial device. And what happened so, to your energy gain at that point? Did it did so, it work in that so we're we're not we're not talking about energy gain in that right. in that domain. So this is this is a test reactor at a much smaller scale than than an energy producing reactor uh, has to be. So these these devices are very difficult to build, um, and they're very difficult to build and, and expensive to build at a scale that's necessary to actually produce net energy gain. Uh, of course, we have a plan to do that. Twenty twenty six a pre production um, pilot plant. Um, and then in the tw early 2030s, we'll have a, a plant that actually produces electricity. Um, but the key thing is that 100 million degrees is the is considered the threshold for, for for commercial fusion energy. So to have achieved that in a device that's so small is a really really significant uh, achievement, and especially with such a, a relatively small amount of private funding that we've we've benefited from. So at one stage, you must have been or had the hottest thing in the universe yes point. absolutely we 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 had um so, so we absolutely were the hottest place in in the solar system um <laughs> for for some hundreds of milliseconds so so this is this is how it works that and, uh you yeah. and, and that's the, that's the length of time it takes so you're because to my um addled and thick brain having <laughs> something at 100 million degrees celsius for any serious period of time sounds actually really very dangerous Oh gosh, no! It's it's certainly not dangerous. No, so so in the end, we will absolutely have 100 million degrees C burning plasma um, that we sustain indefinitely for, for indefinite periods of time. So um, the the reason that this is this is possible is because of the design of the machine and the use of very powerful electromagnets to hold this burning plasma away from the walls and actually allow you to get to that temperature in the first place. Uh, but to come to your point on safety, the thing to remember with fusion is it's so difficult to make this process happen that if anything goes wrong, it simply stops. And at any point in time, there's only a few seconds worth of fuel that's actually in that device. So if you want to put it out, it's as easy as blowing a puff of air into the machine to simply put it out. And in fact, you know, at, at these scales, every shot ends in in failure, essentially. So the, the, the purpose of this device is to learn how to control plasma. So it, it, it's an absolutely routine thing for it to crash into the walls or uh, dissipate. And that's that's just normal. That happens every time. When you say it crashes into the wall, can you can you describe what it the plasma looks like can you talk us through what what that experience is like looking at it you've you've hit on an excellent point what does it look like so actually most of it is completely um transparent or opaque i don't know what the right word is it doesn't actually <laughs> emit light <laughs> I mean, i'm going to struggle to be the next brian cox here if i keep messing that up <laughs> i'll hold back on this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no so um so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is describe what plasma is, because I've used the term a few times, and and that's that's really important, isn't it? So you get taught in school about solids, liquids, and gases, and you're going up in temperature to reach each of those. Well, what they don't tell you is there's actually a fourth one, and that's called plasma. So as you heat beyond gas, um, what happens is that the the constituent parts of the atom, uh, which is your pluses and your minuses, you may remember the picture of you know electrons whizzing around the centre of the atom. Well, they become completely disassociated with one another. The electron can waft free of the confines of the uh, of of the nucleus of the atom, or something that we call ions. Um, and of course, if we want to heat to 100 million degrees Celsius, we're going to end up with a plasma. Um, and the good thing about plasma is that it can it can actually be controlled by very powerful electromagnets. So by by heating to these temperatures and by using very powerful electromagnets, we can suspend this blob, this plasma, in free space, um, heat it to the point where it begins to fuse. So these these special isotopes of hydrogen are coming together with such force that they crash together and fuse to form helium. And then in doing that process, massive amounts of energy are released and absorbed in, in actually in the form of heat in the walls of the machine. From there on, it's a simple process. Boil it, boil some steam, go for it. 
And does everyone have the same method that you do? The, the electromagnets holding the plasma in place, firing the laser at it. Is everybody doing the same type of, I guess, what is tokamak process? So the, answer is, the answer is no. Um, there are many weird and wonderful ways that this is done. Uh, and just to be clear that we don't use a laser-based right. process. We actually have lots of lasers, very, very powerful lasers to measure what's going on inside the plasma. Um, because as I've said, it's not so that there are some visible elements of it, but you need to look right into the core that's super hot and actually doesn't emit that form of light. Um, but no, there, there are other companies who are pursuing all manner of weird and wonderful ways of crashing together um, hydrogen and, and squashing it together to form helium. So lasers is, uh, is one. There are also methods that involve very powerful hydraulic rams to squish it together. Um, there are, uh, pro probably about five different companies now who are following the the tokamak route which is which is our route with various different shapes and sizes of reactors and schemes um the key here is that there's there's just in in the last few years especially there's been a huge inrush of private investment so there's been in the region of five billion dollars uh worldwide invested mostly in the last two years into private fusion uh, enterprises and the reason there is because we need to address this uh this need for low carbon energy to deliver our base load power um and yeah so that's and we're, we're playing we're in a that race place. we're in a race here. we're in a bit of a race against time to get this done hence why yeah. you've you've set some of it your company has set some dates on what you yes. want to do next so you say by 2026 you want to build the next prototype yes w what is that what is the next prototype so so the next prototype is so it's a device that's called st80 hts so snazzy snazzy, snazzy. <laughs> we, we we shorten it to st80 uh internally because it rolls off the tongue a little easier um and this device is going to demonstrate the ability to do long pulse fusion so this is this is as you said earlier it's you know very difficult to uh, to hold this thing going for a long time uh, and this device will be able to hold that for about a thousand seconds um the key the key innovation that we're bringing to bear here in this device uh is is the hds parts the high temperature superconducting magnets and this has been the real game changer in recent years that's enabled this private route to fusion so i'm, I'm going to I'm going to take a little diversion now and t tell you all about these powerful magnets, if yeah. I may. So, as I said, in order to control this this star, effectively we're building a star chamber, we need to use powerful electromagnets in order to suspend this plasma in free space, allowing us to have this fusion happening without touching the walls. Um, in order to make such powerful magnetic fields, uh, the way we have to do it is using magnets. And when I say magnets, most people think about the things that you stick on your fridge at home, little blobs of uh, magnetic stuff that tend to get attracted to other blobs of magnetic stuff. Uh, but in the business of making high magnetic fields, this isn't how it's done. We use what's called electromagnets. So these are, these are magnets that are made from coils of wire that are wound round and round and round. You pass a very, very high current through that wire and that generates a magnetic field. So you you may remember these sort of experiments from school where you you, you can see the needle of a you know a compass changing as you put current on and off. And um, when you want to make the sort of eye-watering magnetic fields that we're talking about in our device, um, you you would you would melt ordinary metals. So if we if we wound the coils of copper, for example, like your your electrical wiring at home, it would evaporate within you know, less than a second. Um, so what we have to use is special branch of materials called superconductors. So superconducting materials are special wires that when cooled to extremely low temperatures, so typically less than minus 269 degrees Celsius, so very, very icy cold, they have this amazing property that they have absolutely zero uh, electrical resistance. Wow. So absolutely zero. It's not just low, it's literally zero. Uh, so, so that means that you can pass a current through these special wires that's very, very large, and it generates no heat whatsoever. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And the most amazing thing is that this is used actually routinely in things like MRI scanners, for example. So if you've ever been in an MRI scanner, you will have immersed yourself inside the field of a superconducting magnet. Wow. So, um, Hannah, so you've got what yep. strikes me as one of the coldest things on the planet. 
yes. next to one of the hottest things in the solar system. That's yes. just mad. <laughs> I love yeah, that. it's pretty. It's pretty mad. It's pretty mad. Um, but it's absolutely doable. Yeah. We 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 can do this. This so is need, um, so you need the you need yeah. the very very cold so the wires don't melt so you can create the super mag electromagnetic field to hold the plasma in place to make this happen. And this prototype That's that you're right. going to build by 2026 will have those properties and be able to do it for longer without the plasma. I'm going to, it seems yes. to me that it's, we're talking about flubber here anyway, but the, the, yeah, thing, sure. the thing bouncing yeah. against the wires and sort of dissipating and then that. The yeah, sure. Right. So there's an awful lot of stuff between the actual wires and the, and the plasma, which is why it's possible to have that yeah. sort of temperature gradient. So there's all kinds of shielding and uh, yeah, all kinds and of things. And then you say, so that happened in 2026, early 2030s, you're building a power plant. That's right. That's right. Talk to me about so, what that power plant's going to look like, where potentially it might be, and how it's going to work. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, in terms of where it might be, we have to we have to site it somewhere that's um, that's appropriate for a device like that. So we have to make use of a fuel that's called tritium. So that's a special special type of helium that that it's um, it's so it's extremely rare. You actually have to breed it inside the reactor in order to to make use of it, which is every little bit of this sounds complicated, doesn't it? it, does. um, it really so does. we have to cite it somewhere that has a, a, a tritium license. So we have a, a whole bunch of people who are figuring out where that device has to go. Um, and this device will have again, it will have our high temperature superconducting magnets. So very special type of the of the superconducting magnets that are very, very powerful. Um, it have a major radius, so that means the radius from the middle of the machine to the middle of the plasma that's in the region of three meters. Um, so the, the 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 entire expanse of equipment that has to go around it. So, for example, uh, beams that fire into the plasma to heat it up, uh, vacuum systems. Um, tritium handling systems um, that will cover a much larger expanse and the building has to be you know some some sort of 10 to 20 meters tall in order to make assembly and maintenance of that system possible so we're, so. we're, we're talking about a, a really big investment and a, and a quite a, and a large in that sense structure around it to to make this power plant in the early 2030s and is your ambition that this happens in the uk yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it will it will 100% happen in the UK and the model is then once we've once we've figured out how to make these things, they can actually be deployed anywhere in the world. Really? So wow. any yeah, that, that that's one of the great things about fusion is that you can deploy this technology anywhere in the world and one of the best applications for it are areas that have very high population density, don't have great access to renewable energy. Um, and of course, don't want to continue to burn fossil fuels like everyone. Um, this, and this how, is this is. A, yeah. How many power plants are you going to? Do you know roughly? I saw a question about how many do you think you might need for Britain, say, for a country our size? Um, I honestly wouldn't wouldn't like to answer that question because I'm a so I'm I'm a very techie kind of magnet in, okay. uh, expert and the uh, the big wide world of the energy industry isn't something I'd like no, no, to. I, uh, I guess what I'm asking is, could you produce mm. enough power from one of the reactors from one of these power plants to power the entire UK? Or oh, okay. All households in the no. UK, or are you going to need you're going to need one in Oxford? No, you're going to need one in Derbyshire. You know, whatever. It's like that. It's exactly like that. So, so the 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 vision is to have power plants that produce several hundred megawatts of power. So we're not talking what for the UK. It will be yet yeah, many, many, many for the for a for a given country. And and your what gives you the certainty that you can make this happen in the early twenty thirties, which seems very, very, very close, given that. Nuclear fusion has been looked at for years, decades and decades and decades. And the the, yep. the joke or the suggestion is it's always 30 years away. Yeah, sure. So the first thing to say is the, the early 2030s is simply the first device uh, that proves that it's possible, that actually generates uh, a nominal 200 megawatts of electricity. Uh, what, what we say then is that the rollout of this technology, so the building of all of the reactors to populate the UK, the wider world, that will happen in the 2040s. Okay, so 2030s is the point where we've demonstrated that this is possible and doable with the with our design of reactor. 
We still have to wait to the 2040s to really roll it out. Um, but as you know, our goal, as the UK's goal, is to be net carbon zero by uh, by 2050. So it's got a really important role to play in achieving that target. What I um, what I absolutely love about this is your description of the technology and how advanced it has got makes me confident that you guys know what you're doing, that people know what they're doing and they're getting closer and closer and closer. And that by the time my children are my age, mm. this will be a reality. This will be there it will mm. be, and they will look back on silly mum and dad driving in combustible engine cars and think you were yeah. crazy. What were you doing? Yeah, I know. This is a legacy that we have to leave to our children, isn't it? This this is this is what really kind of gets gets me and, and everyone at Tokamak Energy out of bed in the morning. There there's two things I would say. The the reason that you choose to work in this field is because of that drive to achieve something that's really important for for humanity actually it sounds really kind of tongue-in-cheek and a bit coy but that that's that really is it uh, but the other thing is that it's it's very technically challenging which for people like me who love to solve technical challenges um it really is a, it is a playground so it's it's the golden opportunity and i would i would really encourage anyone who's listening to to your show be whatever age they are that this is a field that you can come to and work in to make a really important contribution to humanity as a whole delivering something that we absolutely need and you'll have a absolute blast doing it and that's tangible this isn't like something far off far flung a thought in someone's head this is really really happening no absolutely not we're, we're building on decades and decades of research uh into this field and the the tokamak as a as a as a energy producing device is the most widely researched and advanced technology of all of the methods that have been that are being uh, tested um so we're we're confident now that we can do this and as you say you, you you know you you put your trust in me that that i know what i'm doing the people i'm looking around at are my counterparts in the other divisions of the of the teams at Tokamak Energy. So I work in the magnets department and I'm very confident that we can build these extremely powerful magnets. And I look at, at the, you know, the reactor technologies team and I know that they, they're, they're confident that they can build the shielding materials and the, the diverters to handle the heat loads that this star is pumping out onto them. Uh, and the cryogenics team who have to keep these magnets at minus 250 whilst there's a star next door. Um, we have to lean on each other and build on the expertise of everyone to get this get this done so that's why i say that these are the people who will who will change the world it's it's a massive team effort